sure we got the whole crew here. We don't want to disappoint you. Also. Thank you all for coming on out. We don't usually get this much excitement in uh, room 110. This is awesome. Thank you all for coming. Got everybody that we want here. Thank you all for coming. Um, remind me real quickly, too, in, in terms of the order of uh, where Jessica go. In, in fairness, I mean, what is the order in which we want to have? You introduce Secretary Glitzen and then uh, okay. Terrific. Outstanding. Again, I, I do appreciate you being here uh, very much. We've talked certainly on the campaign trail for quite some time about what was going to be done with Medicaid expansion. How was this going to be dealt with? What was going to be the methodology? It comes down to several things, and you all know this. I mean, cost is is primary among them. It just is. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what the solution is. If there is not a way to pay for it, uh, then it would not be an option uh, for the long term. And we want long term solutions. We want things that actually have sustainability. Uh, and to that end, I am uh, grateful, not only by the caliber, caliber of people that are with me, but I do want to introduce uh, our uh, Secretary of the uh, Health and Family Services Cabinet, uh, Vicki Glisson. She has come in uh, full speed uh, in three weeks. It's three weeks that feels like three months uh, or three years uh, in some respects, but she has hit the ground running. Uh, and at this point, I want to introduce her to you. I think you all know her. Let her speak briefly. Uh, introduce uh, a gentleman who may not be a stranger to many of you, but we will reintroduce him to you. Uh, and then we will uh, discuss specifically what it is we're about and uh, take any questions that you have. So, Vicki. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you this morning, and I want to say that um, I have had a, a, a baptism by fire in the last three weeks, and I have hit the ground running, and I've enjoyed meeting the folks that I've met there at the Cabinet and then working closely with the Governor, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to continuing to work with the Governor and then uh, again with the folks that we're going to be talking about today as we try to address the issue of Medicaid expansion and the impact it has on our, on our state and on the cabinet, as well as well as other issues. So thank you again for uh, letting me be with you this morning, and I'll look forward to working with you in the future. And I'll turn it now over to. I tell you what, let me let me briefly introduce uh, the gentleman to my to my left and uh, your right. Uh, Mark Birdwhistle is a man who I think is known to to many of you. He's a man who used to be the cabinet secretary. Uh, he's a man with decades of experience uh, in the healthcare arena and in Medicaid specifically. He's been the CEO of a healthcare organization. He's currently the vice president for health services at the University of Kentucky uh, Health Center uh, and the University Hospital System. He's a man who is probably as knowledgeable as anybody in America, uh, certainly in the top handful that anybody would be able to come up with on Medicaid issues specifically. And so Mark is going to be working very specifically with us, very closely with us, to come up with a waiver program uh, that we are going to discuss with CMS. It is what we discussed with many of you on the campaign trail and even in the days that have uh, transpired since the campaign was decided. We are going to submit to CMS uh, a solution uh, that we are going to work with them on. I'll come back to talking about what has transpired already in my discussions. But before I do that, let me turn it over to Mark, who will talk about some of the ways in which he has ideas that will be brought to bear as it relates to various waivers that can be combined, but also what some of his experiences and his optimism for how we will be able to come up with a sustainable solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Governor. Um, I just want to say it's such a pleasure to be a part of this creative opportunity for the Commonwealth. Uh, many of you know that I have dealt with the Medicaid system for a number of years, more number, more years than I care to even uh, want to tabulate. But this is a very challenging time. The people of Kentucky need a Medicaid system that is affordable and sustainable. And I'm very pleased to be able to work with the governor, Secretary Gleason, and her team to try to come up with a solution. We've looked at other models in other states uh, one of the things that we keep talking about, uh, looking at the Indiana model, my personal preference is we need a Kentucky model, a, con a model that meets the needs of Kentucky. I would like to say I'd like to thank 
uh, the University of Kentucky for freeing up some time to allow me to uh, participate in this opportunity to, to work on a transformative Medicaid system for Kentucky. So I think at that point, I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you again for the opportunity, and I look forward to working with you and talking as days come ahead. Thank you. Let me just give you just a bit of background about kind of what led to this. Again, it was a culmination of many things, conversations I've had with many of you uh, in the media, with many of you uh, in the general population as we've gone about uh, the course of the campaign, and then again, as I said, in the days since that time. We've had many conversations with people on all sides of this issue. I've talked to people who are on the ground level, people who are recipients not only of traditional Medicaid, but people who are recipients of expanded Medicaid. I had a very extensive and, and substantive conversation uh, a few days ago, actually a couple, I guess it was a week or two ago now, uh, with Health and uh, Human Services Secretary uh, Sylvia Burwell uh, in Washington. She is somebody who's very committed to this uh, from that perspective. She and I had a good conversation about what solutions look like for Kentucky. It is our intention to work with CMS, as we have said that we would, to put together a waiver program, which again, as a reminder, is the equivalent of receiving, rather than a one-size-fits-all model to Medicaid solutions, a block grant, for lack of a better description, that would come to us in the form of dollars through a waiver program Traditionally, people who have applied for waivers, and they have been states like most close in proximity to us, Indiana, but others to use them to varying degrees, Pennsylvania, Arkansas, and others. Indiana's is the model that, frankly, is most likely that we will look to replicate the best examples of. But they've used what are known as 1115 waivers. Starting in 2017, there is the ability to utilize something known as 1332 waivers. Those are, no, those are going to be available to uh, folks starting in January of 2017. Mark is as conversant and as knowledgeable about that and other things as anybody that I know of, or again, as we said earlier, that exists, period. And so to that end, he is going to be working on what can we do to customize a solution, something that truly is transformative. The intent here is not just to plug and play. We are going to transform the way in which Medicaid is delivered in Kentucky. And this transformation, I think, will be a model to the nation. That is the intention. It is to find a solution for us, but one that, frankly, will serve as a beacon for others as well, because ultimately, it's a function of making sure it's sustainable. We are spending the taxpayers' money. We have a need to fulfill. We understand that. As many of you are aware, the number that is often quoted is that we have 25% of Kentuckians on Medicaid. Sadly, that number is, is just about 30% now. It's, it's over 1.3 million Kentuckians, so fast approaching 30%. That number is trending in that direction. That is literally not sustainable financially. The only way in which we are going to allow it to continue in any form traditional, expanded, or otherwise, is to transform the way in which it is delivered, transform what that looks like, to ensure that all of Kentucky's citizens have access to health care, not just in name, not just a card, but actual access. And ultimately, the reason being is that we want them to have better health outcomes. That is the purpose. That is the absolute intent behind everything that you're hearing today. So with that, let me stop and say, let me say one final thing. What will happen, and this may anticipate some of the questions you will ask, what will happen from this day forward is the very thing that has been happening but will happen in a more accelerated fashion. There will be increasing dialogue between us and CMS. CMS is the disperser of Medicaid dollars. We will have continued dialogue from the secretary level uh, at that uh, organization cabinet to, to our own uh, cabinet. We are going to utilize the expertise of Mark Birdwell. And I'll tell you, I too want to reiterate my appreciation to the University of Kentucky, to President Capilouto for his graciousness and willingness to, again, loan, essentially, uh, the expertise to allow us Mr. Birdwell's capability as a consultant, to help us, us come up with something that there will be nothing like in America. It will be cutting edge. It will be transformative. 
And I think ultimately the onus will be on us and CMS to come up with a solution that works. That is what we are going to be doing. I truly believe that by the middle of next year, we will have an opportunity uh, to know whether this is going to work or not. It will take many months before we truly have gotten to a point where we can see the lay of the land. But over the course of the next months, we will be in dialogue, and I think by the middle of next year, we will have a game plan that's going to work and be able to be implemented, or it will be clear to us that that is not possible. I am absolutely confident that we can make this work. I'm confident that CMS will meet us in good faith, and I look forward to that dialogue and continued discussion, which has come out of the gate well. Any questions that you have? Uh, and in fairness, I'll start here with Brad. I'll start on this side of the room, and we'll, we'll work our way across. And I'll repeat, if you, if you don't want to use that, I'll repeat the question if there's... Governor Bevan, we know there's several studies that say 1115 waivers would cost an additional 2% compared to what we have now. With the 1332 waivers, would that be cheaper? And could the 1332 waivers, would that be similar to the Kentucky Health Choice waiver that you worked on while you were in the cabinet? I'll, I'll let Mark speak to, to the latter part of your question, but let me say this. The point of waivers, and I cannot reiterate this enough, frankly, this isn't about saving money specifically, although clearly we cannot afford the traditional approach. So the point of the waiver is not just that it allows you to save money, although if utilized properly and if structured properly, there will be economies of scale, there will be efficiencies that will allow us ultimately to deliver more for less per capita. But the absolute dollar number is still going to be significant. I will tell you, and this is something that's important for you to understand, the traditional Medicaid alone is cost prohibitive to the state of Kentucky as it exists right now. Despite all the happy talk that came out of the previous administration, Despite all of the claims that this study from the Deloitte uh, accounting firm showed that this expansion was actually paying for itself, that was a lie, a straight-up, straight-out lie. And, in fact, for fiscal year 2016, which is the year we're in right now, that ends in six months, there will be, for traditional Medicaid alone, a $128 million shortfall for this fiscal year alone, this was known by the outgoing administration, and yet we hung on to misleading you all to believe that somehow this is sustainable. It is not. So your point about the cost is a good one, and the question is a good one. But ultimately, this isn't just about where we can spend the least amount of money. It's how can we ensure that Kentuckians are healthier have access to, take advantage of, and are made better by their ability to be healthy citizens. That is the point of this. And to make people as undependent as is possible, ultimately, so that we can take people from a point where they have absolute need for full dependency on this program to a point at which they are able, like so many in this room, to be able to enter the marketplace in kind of a private sector format where they can buy their own health insurance policy, have gradations along the way. This is ultimately the point. But we, more than the dollars, want to ensure that we have people with good health outcomes. That's the point of this. And this is what we are going to work uh, with CMS to develop. And specific to the second question and the nuance of whether this is like that previous program, Mark, do you want to make a comment about that? Um. When I was health secretary uh, during the Fletcher administration, we exercised what was called state plan amendments, which were authorized under the Deficit Reduction Act. Uh, those provisions are still there. Uh, quite honestly, that may be one of the first things we start looking at is in anticipation of a waiver, what could we do with state plan approval authority with uh, CMS? to get some savings in the short run. So we did not have an 1115 waiver. We had a 1915B waiver, uh, which we authorized the KenPAC program. But uh, in answer to your question, the 1332, that's the latest and greatest model. We're still trying to figure out what that does. To me, I'm enticed by trying to do something that is the latest and the greatest. Uh, 
there is an option of doing an 1115 with a 1332 on top. So, but this is the beginning of the process, and that's the message we wanted to get across today is we're beginning the process, we're putting the right people in place, we're bringing the expertise to the table and want to assemble a plan and keep people informed in the process. Now, one of the things we have not brought forward uh, to this point in this conversation, there will be involvement of stakeholders. Uh, there is no way you can do this process without having involvement of consumers, advocates, providers, uh, we want to learn from the best practices from other states as well. So this will be an iterative process, and we want to go through it fairly uh, aggressively, but also very thoughtfully. Other questions? Tom, do you have a question? Uh, Governor, I think the main concern of a lot of people uh, was raised by Governor Bashir at the end of his administration. Hundreds of thousands of people who received health insurance for the first time under Obamacare Connect, primarily through Medicaid expansion, uh, could lose their insurance under some of the policies you spoke about during your campaign. Uh, how do you reply to that, and what's the outlook uh, regarding those folks uh, potentially losing their insurance in the next year or two because of changes that are uh, being initiated by you today? I really hope you've been listening to what I've just said. I'm not sure that you have in light of that question. But in fairness, what we are trying to come up with is a solution to avoid. It's interesting, the concerns raised by the outgoing administration that you allude to were absolutely smoke screens for the true concerns that they'd been lying to people about. I don't use that word lightly. I've used it twice now and very intentionally. For them to disregard a $128 million shortfall while trying to create a, a concern over something that, frankly, was never a true concern. It could be hypothesized that it was. But the truth be told, we are trying to find a solution for exactly that subset you're talking about. That is the whole purpose of everything we're doing with this waiver program. The enrollment process took place from November 1st to December 15th for qualified health plans and enrollment for uh, the Medicaid expansion is sort of an ongoing thing but has a, a window that sort of closes uh, I think sometime in January but ultimately is an ongoing process. There are always people coming into and going out of Medicaid. Medicaid, we had 850,000 plus or minus folks on Medicaid before there was expansion. We had about 22 percent of Kentuckians on Medicaid prior to. We don't need the existing uh, conduit, Connect in this case, to be the on-ramp for Medicaid. We had 22% of us who'd found our way onto that without that conduit. And I think all of that commentary that came from the outgoing administration was meant to distract those of you in the media and those who watch and listen to and read what you write from the true issues at hand, which were the fact that this is imploding financially. And they didn't want us to focus on that. And that's unfortunate. Other questions that any of you have? Good morning, Governor. You said definitively during your campaign that this would happen, that you would be able to make this transition work. Just a few minutes ago, you said we'll know next year whether this indeed can be the case. Are you less confident today that you can fulfill this campaign promise than you were on the campaign trail? No, I'm equally as confident or uncertain uh, at the same time. I never, and I would def challenge anybody to find where I definitively said we would absolutely make this work. It is our intention to make it work. Based on my conversations with Secretary Burwell, among others, with, with Mark Birdwell, with our secretary, uh, with the lieutenant governor, with others who have weighed in on this, and people who are experts on this in the community, I have confidence that we can come up with a solution. Whether CMS ultimately agrees with it and is willing to grant that waiver is beyond our control. I have no ability to predict that. But I feel very confident based on the initial dialogue and the degree of, of conviction that we bring and what I believe uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services brings to the equation that we will find a good and viable and financially sustainable solution. I'm as confident uh, but as unable to predict with certainty as I have ever been. 
In fact, I'm, I'm more confident that we'll come up with a viable solution in light of the fact that Mark uh, is able to help us with this effort. Governor, you mentioned next year, are you talking about 16, that you hope to have a plan to present to Washington? And if so, when would you like to have it in effect, and what would the features of it be as you envision it? Sure. Again, the features are going to be defined in the way we have just been discussing, which will be probably some combination of whatever waiver programs are available to us. You know, when we talk about the latest and greatest, 1332s were part of the Affordable Care Act. They are part of their provision in there that they will be made available to states like ourselves, starting in January of 2017. We will look at how we can utilize those together with those that are already available to states like ours, like which is in the form of 1115 waivers. So in terms of the timing, the dialogue is, has already begun, but it will begin in earnest. It will begin with Mark shepherding this process in conjunction with our cabinet and ensuring that we have over the course of the next six months, very substantive conversation. At the end of six months, there's not a, a set deadline for this, but if in fact we are making progress, that will become clear to us, I think, over the course of the next couple of quarters. I would expect by the middle of 2016, the calendar year, that we will have a very clear understanding of whether this is going to work or not. And when I say transformative, I, I use that very intentionally. This will not be another version of something you've seen. I have cited, and you've heard me cite, my uh, Im impressions of the model that has been used in Indiana. There is much in that model that we can learn from, much in that model that is good. But I will tell you, it is nothing perfect. There is no perfect plan, nor will we come up with a perfect plan. But we will come up with one that is customized specifically for Kentucky. And I am confident that over the course of the next six months, uh, with Mr. Birdwhistle at the helm, we will come up with a solution that allows us to know then in the last six months of 2016 whether we're implementing it or whether we have come up short. So in the meantime, nothing changes? It, no, I mean, it, it must be, again, people already enrolled. You know, I hope you understand that. I mean, this is all this is sort of a rolling sort of a process. So enrollment for anybody on Connect, for example, already has closed. That's that the enrollment was this past year, the year that we're winding up now for the year to come. And this will be the variation on that same theme. We are now trying to come up with a solution in 2016 that will affect us January 1st of 2017 and beyond. OK. Just hang, hang on. Don't, I'll come back to you, Al. I, you know how much I love you. What happens middle of next year if you don't come up with a viable plan? What happens in the middle of next year? Again, we yes. continue to move forward under the structure that we currently have. And, and, and I can only hypothesize. I could do a thousand what ifs. I'm going into this with absolute confidence based on the dialogue we've had that we will come up with a transformative solution, that we will come up with something that transforms Kentucky's approach to Medicaid. And again, I truly think will be a model uh, for other states and for this nation, because as unaffordable as it is to us, with rare exception, no other state is so flush with cash they can afford to have a third of their population on Medicaid either. Governor, you spoke in the campaign about not enrolling people at 138%. Uh, was any part of your discussion with Secretary Burwell or your consideration uh, now with Mark uh, reducing the eligibility level, uh, which has not been done in any other state uh, right. that has uh, uh, transformed or changed Medicaid? Yeah, it was, it was always my intention that we would not continue to enroll people. That's not actually possible. And so to that end, given the current, and it goes back to the questions that were talked about here. Because of a rolling, it would be possible on a going forward basis, but we're dealing with decisions that were made in one year affect the next year. So when I say it's not possible, it's not possible over the course of the next 12 months because of decisions that were made in 2015. And so to that end, what we will be doing in 2016 is determining exactly how things will be handled in 2017. So it is still my intent that going forward, what I've always said is under the existing construct, that is not something we're going to do. And I still believe that because we cannot afford to enroll people up to 138 percent under the existing reimbursement model, the existing construct for Medicaid, which is why we want to transform the system. It's why we want to come up with a customized solution for ourselves 
so that January 1st, 2017 and beyond, we have something that is viable, sustainable, transformative, and ultimately provides the services that we want to people from a health care standpoint. Well, it's one possibility then that people say from 100% of poverty to 138% would be required to have uh, certain skin in the game, perhaps ascending levels of skin. All these, you've, again, we've had this conversation along the way, and indeed I continue to feel this way that I think, and we said it even at the outset, ultimately we want to take people from full dependency to a point where they can sustain themselves. And so there will, of course, as part of a waiver program, and indeed those that have been granted thus far, including in Indiana and other places, there are varying degrees of, to use your term, skin in the game that people have, and I think this is important. I think it's important for us to give to empower people because with this comes dignity. We owe people the dignity and the self-respect that comes with being able to make decisions for themselves even while they are dependent on the assistance of others. This is what we'll do. I'm excited by the team. I'll tell you what, with Secretary Glisson, with Mr. Birdwell, with our Lieutenant Governor, with the other people in this cabinet and on this team, there is no doubt in my mind that we will come up with a viable solution. Whether all parties will agree with us is to be determined, and we will find that out in the months ahead. I appreciate you all being here. I look forward to speaking to you again in the weeks ahead as we roll into the budget process. That should be fun. Stay tuned. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Do you think what the role of the legislature will be in this? I mean, obviously, until we have a plan, it's not like they can comment. I don't think that's what Robert's